Welcome to My on Mondays, an explorative approach to the possessive my through narratives, art, and sound. Each Monday brings a new creation and unique perspective. My on Mondays is brought to you by Ming Studios, a contemporary art space and international artist residency program dedicated to the exhibition, experience, and exploration of arts and culture. Along with exhibiting artists from around the world, Ming also serves the community by hosting innovative programs including performances, workshops, screenings, readings, artist talks, and other cultural activities. For more information or if you'd like to participate in Maya on Mondays, you can visit our website at mingstudios.org. Hello and welcome to the 57th episode of My on Mondays. Today is part one of two episodes focused on the Gullah Geechee people and culture of the Sea Islands of South Carolina, Georgia, and Northern Florida. For this first episode, which is part of our Disappearing World series, I'm speaking with Luana Graves, a writer and the founder of the nonprofit organization and podcast Low Country Gullah. In our conversation, she talks about her own journey, the origins of the Low Country Gullah Foundation, and the work she's doing to help Gullah people retain their land in the face of development and the complicated legal challenge of heirs' property. Congratulations on everything that you're doing. I, your website is such a wealth of information I particularly love. I was reading the um, Changing Perspectives, I think, yes. that series yes. that you're doing. God, it's so, I mean, beautifully written and um, Thank you. such a wealth of information. Yeah, um, well, you know, my work began to be very personal and that made a tremendous impact not only on me but on my family and on my work yeah and so you know it, it just has taken on a whole nother life yeah and you know focus and and um perspectives and you know it's just that personal mess of it uh is just so much different yeah, because you weren't born in the area. You didn't even discover you were Gullah Geechee until after you moved to the South, right? Right, yeah. right. I had um, a couple of my great aunts would always say, um, you know, that they were Geechee, but they never said mm -hmm. what that was or why they were saying it or, or anything like that. So, so you didn't um, even have a concept of what it was. You just heard this word? I just heard the word. Okay. Um, in retrospect, I realize now that I was growing up in a Gullah Geechee um, culture and traditions. Yeah. Um, and my only exposure to someone who was Gullah um, in my 20s, I was dating a guy and he his ex-girlfriend was a Gullah. Mm -hmm. And so she was the first person that was Gullah that I had ever met. And she had a very, you know, thick accent. Mm. And I didn't fully understand. I mean, he identified her as Gullah. Or she identified herself as Gullah. Uh -huh. But, you know, as far as what that meant and, and everything else, all I knew is that she was Gullah and from South Carolina. Mm -hmm. That was it. Um, so fast forward to, you know, six years or so ago, that's when I realized, um, you know, the magnitude of that and growing up the way that I was. Mm -hmm. um, doing certain things and eating certain things, um, yeah. you know, that, that it was, it was all very Gullah, but I just didn't know it. Yeah. So can you give people a brief intro? Yeah, absolutely. My story kind of starts once upon a time, you know, I was about seven or eight, something like that. And I had to write a report on the pilgrims. At the time, you know, I just kind of threw this report together 
and I made the mistake of leaving it on my dining room table um, in the house, and my mother came along and found it. And so that was the beginning and the end of my writing career, (laughs) 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 literally. Because she she saw the report. Um, I have to say, my mother um, at the time was a seventh grade English teacher. Mm-hmm. So um, with her teacher hat on, she saw the report in the middle of the night or late at night. And she woke me up and made me stay up all night and rewrite it, do the oh. whole research and everything. Oh. And it so turned me off to mm-hmm. writing mm-hmm. that, um, you know, I just didn't enjoy it anymore. And what I learned from that then is that I like writing what I like, how I like to write it. Mm -hmm. Now, mind you, I did go to to college for journalism and um, mass communication, but I wasn't looking to to be a writer. I was really looking at the technical side. You know, I'd done the news. I'd done radio. um, you know, I was doing all of these other things and I had dabbled in newspaper writing and I dabbled in magazine, but I really didn't like it because it was technical. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I didn't like being forced into the box of this is how you have to, you know, write. Yeah. And so when I got to Hilton Head and I always knew I was a good writer. I mean, if I needed to write a letter, I could write a slamming letter and you know, mm-hmm. it was mm-hmm. fabulous and all of that. So I always knew that I was a good writer. I just didn't really enjoy it for the sake of writing. Mm-hmm. And so when I got to Hilton Head, um, the, the backstory is that I had a business in Florida Um, And I was kind of burnt out from that. And my mother was in the process of moving up here to Hilton Head. And uh, so I was came up to Hilton Head and I'd been familiar with the island because I'd been coming here since I was about 10 or so. And here's the other thing. I was my my sister's roommate in college lived on Hilton Head and was from one of the prominent Gullah families. So all my life, again, I was exposed to Gullah, but in my child head, never made the connections. Uh Okay. Yeah. So when I was here and, and my sister had passed away unexpectedly. So since my mother just moved and things were kind of unsettled, I said, you know, I'll just stay here for a while. No job, no plan or anything. And we were driving down the street one day. And we were passing by Hilton Head Monthly Magazine. And I said to her, you know, just pull in. I'll go see, you know, maybe I can do something part time or sell the magazine or whatever, Mm. because that was my background in sales. And so when I was talking to the publisher, that was my thought, you know, I'll sell the magazine. And she's like, well, you know, I don't really need anybody to sell it, but we really would like to do more of a focus on the Gullah community Mm. and she's just like you know we always need like a freelance writer and I said okay (laughs) and so you know she's just like we really want to diversify things and my mother teaches diversity in college Mm -hmm. on the college level I'm like okay hold on I'll go home get her bring her back (laughs) you know and you guys can work it out and she'll write for you you know because I had no (laughs) no plan on on being in this writing freelance thing Mm. and so they're talking and my mother did wind up writing her own college called diversity a column called Mm -hmm. diversity 101 but the the publisher was just like yeah but we still would like to do something you know focused on gala Mm -hmm. and I said okay All right. All right. All right. It was November. I said, okay, what are you doing for February? And she's just like, well, we haven't even gotten that far to think about what we're going to do. I said, why don't you let me do a black history section? She was like, fine. Mm -hmm. And again, I didn't really have anything um, that I could show the style of my writing or my capabilities. You know, I mean, I think I had some poems, you know, Mm -hmm. that was basically it. But they really trusted me. Mm-hmm. But the, the, the best part about it is they didn't give me any parameters on what they wanted. 
So they let me do it the way that I wanted to. They didn't give me a word count. They didn't say write five articles, one article. They didn't say anything. They just said, go for it. So the end of November to January 1st, I wrote six articles and was like running around the island doing all these interviews. Mm -hmm. And so when I submitted the section, they didn't know how many pages I was going to write until I got it to them. Mm -hmm. And they, I guess, had planned on, you know, maybe six pages or something like that. It turned out to be closer to 15 pages. Mm -hmm. And so they extended the magazine just to accommodate what I did. And it was so well received that it's the first time that people started hoarding the magazine and sending it around the country and talking about it. And so the magazine not only went into reprint, but it was the first time that the magazine, it, it became the best edition that they ever had. And it was like That's 800% great. greater than the last, you know, or uh-huh. the top, you know, one. And so they were like, okay, what can you do next? <laughs> you know, yeah. so so I just started writing an article here, an article there. And then they were like, can you do a column? I said, fine, I'll do a column. And I started writing what I called the first family series of Hilton Head, Mm. which was articles on the the first surnames that came out of um, Mitchellville uh, on Hilton Head, which is the first town for freed slaves Mm. and uh, formerly um, freed slaves. And so that's where Low Country Gala came from. Okay. It came because I had written so much for that magazine. Mm -hmm. Um, at one point I counted, it was more than 300 ma- um, articles and people wow. over the years, and this was back in, I think 2016 was the first year. Um, I'd never been published before. I had never had anything substantial like that, but people started to not only know who I was and were like, oh my gosh, you're the one who wrote that. And, mm-hmm. all, you know, and they would just keep asking me you know, where can I see that article that you did? Mm -hmm. And I was always pointing them to the magazine website. And then one day I was just like, you know, I might as well put all of my stuff on my own website. That way it'll be easier for people to search. Mm -hmm. And it was really out of being lazy, (laughs) you know, (laughs) instead of having to look up the link and all of that, you know, Mm -hmm. it was just like, well, if it's just mine, I could just, you know, point up there and call it a day. Yeah. So all of it was never a fully planned out five-year plan or you know mm-hmm. none of that it was it was all kind of happenstance mm-hmm. but now it's become totally personal yeah. in that it's been part of a journey that I kind of fell into because when I was doing the first family series of articles I kept doing all of these families and I did about 15 different families and one day someone was like, well, when are you going to do your own family? Like, stop mm-hmm. doing ours. Like, you know, <laughs> go do your own. And I was like, you know, that's a good idea. Mm-hmm. And so I I did my own. And, you know, the other thing is a lot of times people were saying, you know, who is this? Who is this woman who's doing all of this Gullah stuff? Is she even Gullah? Yeah. And that's where the I am Gullah article came from, mm-hmm. um, because it it kind of was my way of telling people that I have street cred, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, and and um, I I have uh, you know I'm not culturally appropriating anything because yeah. it's my culture too, and yeah, and whatnot. So I mean that's that's my story. Yeah, you traced your your family back. It's such a beautiful story, and 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 just in how you were just sort of drawn almost like kicking and screaming you know it's sort of like you're just it was this path was laid for you that you just ended up falling right into so I'm sure there are a a lot of people most people in this country probably have never even heard of Gullah Gullah Geechee people or culture Mm -hmm. and so I I'm gonna attempt 
a, a sort of a, a definition. And so, and please, <laughs> please feel free to interrupt me and take okay. over if I get any of it wrong. But go for so it. <laughs> the, the Gullah Geechee people are from mainly originally located in the sea islands of South Carolina, Georgia, and Northern Florida. And they were enslaved people who remained in that area. And because the islands were so isolated, um, they really developed their own unique culture and language as well, or some people might call it a dialect. Um, I need help. <laughs> well, no, but, you know, you're, you're, you're spot on. The mm -hmm. only thing that, that um, I would add mm -hmm. is that they are the direct descendants mm -hmm. of West African enslaved people. Yeah. And because they came, you know, the, the slave trade went to access, whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. about six or seven different African countries. Yeah. And so the Gullah Geechee are essentially the blending of all of those different cultures mm -hmm. and languages and traditions. Yeah. yeah. And then the rest of what you said is spot on. Okay. You know, but but I mean, it, that's where it grew. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the culture, what's really cool about it and fascinating is that because of the commonality of their circumstance, mm -hmm. they made a way out of no way. Think about it. They were forced together for months and months at a time. And so they needed to learn how to communicate to each other. Mm -hmm. You know, they needed to learn how to rely and share with each other their experiences and um, also gain strength from each other. Mm -hmm. So because of that, it not only, like you said, it's a language, dialect, however you want to, to say it, they all came with their old own traditions too. Mm -hmm. So like the language is the blending of mm -hmm. a variety of different African words. Yeah. So, um, you know, in the traditions and the culture and everything. So, so you did pretty good. <laughs> yeah. It, I mean, it's, it's just really, really powerful, obviously horrific circumstances, but also just so powerful the way that, you know, when you talk about finding a way to communicate with each other and survive together, it's, it's yes. really beautiful. So, yeah. Um, so for this episode, there's so much we could talk about. This podcast could go on for hours and hours. Mm -hmm. But for this episode, I wanted to focus on the issue of heirs property because this series, Disappearing Worlds, um, while the Gullah Geechee culture is definitely not disappearing, there is a real problem with land. And so I, I wanted to focus on the issue of heirs property, which is an area mm -hmm. you are doing a lot of work in to raise awareness and get the laws changed. And I'd like to have you explain exactly what heirs property is and why it's become such an issue for the Gullah Geechee people still living on the islands. But um, first, I wanted to read an excerpt from your website, which I thought was particularly poignant. And you say, Gullah culture places tremendous value on its ancestors and the elders. Their significance and wisdom that they impart on the community is invaluable. Most of the families can trace their lineage back five or even seven generations to the enslaved that were on the island. The greatest gift that the enslaved Gullah left behind for their descendants was the land that they worked hard to earn from nothing. And you go on to say later in the next paragraph, to the Gullah, acreage is more than just a lot that has value. It's a priceless, tangible, and visible daily reminder of the blood, sweat, and tears that the ancestors experienced. Yes, yeah, absolutely. That's so beautiful and powerful. So can you, Thank tell, you. tell people exactly what heirs property is and then why it's become such a, a challenge for the Gullah Geechee well, people? Well, you know, if you think about it in the terms that an enslaved person, when emancipation happened, mm -hmm. they had nothing other than the clothes on the back. Yeah. Okay. So in some cases, there were benevolent slave owners who gave land. But in most cases, there are enslaved people who 
worked very hard, raised enough money to purchase land Mm -hmm. for their family because not only did they need a place to live, but it was the start of being able to pass something, having something that they could pass on. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so in Africa, land was not and probably still isn't considered man's. Okay. Mm -hmm. So putting a piece of paper to it is not cultural. It's Mm -hmm. just, you know, it's just not cultural. So, so that concept of, you know, titling is, first of all, it's, it's not culturally Gullah, but, you know, if you think about the time, there are a lot of things like Jim Crow laws and, you know, just racism and, you know, a whole bunch of other things that also played into people not having either proper titling and or establishing wills. Okay. Mm -hmm. So traditionally, most people would just take the land, they would live on the land, live it, farm it, you know, and then when the, let's say, patriarchs, Uh, passed away they would just pass it down to their families Mm -hmm. and in some cases you know let's let's use 100 acres as an example let's say the patriarch has this 100 acres and they have 10 kids you know so everybody gets a cut Mm -hmm. of that 100 acres right and so then their families descendant, 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 you know, they've just been passing this on. Mm-hmm. So that's how things have been going for generations. So now, in the end, come today, you have hundreds and or thousands of people who are technic- technically owners <laughs> Correct. of this Correct. one property. Correct. Mm-hmm. There, and, and so that is the biggest issue with heirs property, mm-hmm. because Let's say I'm one of those descendants and I'm the eldest in the family. My grandparents passed away and, and, you know, so I took over the responsibility of paying the taxes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so I'm living on the land and I've been paying the taxes for, let's say, the last 20 years. Right. Mm -hmm. Because there could be a thousand heirs that can lay claim to that property. And, you know, if it's 100 acres divided by 1,000 people, that's essentially like a handful of dirt and a rock, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, But it doesn't matter because mm-hmm. even if I'm paying for the taxes, I don't own the land. So I'm living on land that is not mine. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of places, the law is not favorable for heirs property. And that's one Mm -hmm. of the things that, you know, I'm working to try and fix because since, since everyone has this claim and they may not even live, let's say the land is in South Carolina, they might live in California, right? Mm -hmm. They may never have even seen the land, know about the land, anything. But if there is a developer Mm -hmm. who wants the land And they can go and identify someone who has a share, even if it's a handful of dirt. Mm -hmm. That one person can say, I want to sell to this developer because I want some money. Yeah. And and so even if, let's say there are five families that are living on the land right now, five Mm -hmm. houses, because the in, in the Gullah community, within the land, they live in what is called compounds, family compounds. Mm-hmm. So if it's a hundred acres, you might have, you know, 30 houses on that hundred acres who represent each of the siblings, mm-hmm. you know, that originally had it. So, but one person can force the sale. And even if all the people who are living on the land and had been paying the taxes and all of that agree, we want to keep it. But one person says, I want to sell it, and they take it to court, Mm -hmm. they, the judge usually sides with selling the land and forces everybody to go. And that's the biggest problem with heirs' property. And, you know, the other thing is, if there is no will, 
that's a whole nother element of Mm -hmm. the issue. So if you have all of these people and there was never a will saying, you know, Johnny, Michael, Sarah, you know, Mm -hmm. all of these people are the, the, the rightful owners of the property and the property, you know, that person passed away. And after 10 years, the, um, you know, resolving the, the property and the, the title mm-hmm. just gets more legally complicated. Yeah. So it's, it's really unfortunate. And one of the things that, you know, going back to your original um, point of what you read, the land is priceless for a few things. Well, first of all, the land on the Sea Islands, once upon a time, nobody wanted it. Yeah. So that's uh-huh. part of the reason why, you know, a lot of people were able to buy land and get it cheap and whatnot, because a lot of it is just marsh, you know, like mm-hmm. swampy marshland. Yeah. But some of it is beachfront. Yeah. And, you know, some people, you know, they they have it, but it was always said to be eh, it's, it's like the garbage land. You can have mm-hmm. it. We don't want it. Flip side to now it's the most valuable land in the country. Oh, yeah. And yeah. so you have people who are trying to, to take it away. Mm-hmm. But even if it is oceanfront, and let's say it's a $2 million property, that $2 million doesn't matter to the family because it's a representation of the legacy that their family and their their ancestors or patriarch was able to provide. So, you know, it's, it's not a land is land and, you know, you can assess it. It's worth $2 million and everybody sees it that way. Yeah. It doesn't go like that when it comes to the Gullah because of all of the things that went into acquiring it as well as holding on to it. Yeah, you're erasing you're erasing the people. I mean, and, and, uh, I mean, when you think about it, even, even like their ancestors are actually buried there on the land and and you just, you are absolutely, um, you're just evicting people from their entire culture, from their, from their history, from their elders, from everything. Exactly. And, you know, the Gullah Geechee culture is one of the only, I mean, obviously Native Americans are indigenous to the United States, but so are the Gullah Geechee Mm -hmm. because the culture grew out of here. Yeah. Oh, that's such an important point. Wow. Oh, yeah. Yeah. When you you think about it. It really is. You know, so, so of the indigenous cultures, those are the two two that I know of. I mean, Mm -hmm. there might be more, but you know, Mm -hmm. that I know. So the difference between the Native Americans and and the Gullah Geechee is the Native Americans, they lost their land. Yeah, it was for, for the most part taken away. And a friend of mine, Lee Brockington, who is amazing, made this point to me. And when she said it to me, it just kind of blew my mind. The Indian Native American culture did not survive as well as it could have because they didn't have their land. Yeah, yeah. The Gullah were able to maintain the culture and their traditions because they kept the land. So when you think of it like that, it just puts even more of a value on it because land is the Gullah culture's yeah. greatest asset. It's vital. It's, I it's, mean, it's vital yeah, to the culture. It's singularly, like, yeah, what holds it together. That's, yeah, so, such an important point. And see, you know, going back to the writing, my plan is to document and preserve as much of the stories and the culture and the traditions and, you know, the people as I could. Mm-hmm. But on the flip side, I can't do all of that if I'm not preserving the land and protecting it too. And so it's hand in hand. Let's say all the land disappears. Great. Now I have a bunch of stories. So, you know, 
they're equally important. And so that's why the nonprofit that, that I'm running, the Low Country Gullah, is doing the work that it's doing. Mm-hmm. And this past October 1st was the tax sale for Beaufort County. And um, I'd been helping people to hold on to their land for years and raising funds to help people pay their taxes and, mm-hmm. and resolve the whole air issue mm-hmm. because it's very complicated and you need attorneys and you yeah. need a genealogist. And there's there's just a whole list of things that, mm-hmm. you know, processes that you have to go through. So that's what the nonprofit does as well as educating people. You know, sometimes people are living on air's property and don't even know it until someone dies. Mm -hmm. Or you have that California cousin Mm -hmm. who says, you know what, guess what? I just sold the land and you all guys, you guys got to go. Yeah. So, you know, so trying to get in front of the cart Mm -hmm. essentially is, is the work that, that um, I do. This year was the first year that I just decided to, I didn't need to go, but I decided to go to the tax sale and the the county treasurer um, is very generous in the fact that she allows you to to um, speak to all of the buyers and inform them about heirs property and um, and say people will be um, announcing that their property is heirs property and please don't bid against it so you're only raising the the redemption costs you know mm-hmm. for them and so. Every single property, it was about 12 that, that um, you know, did go to auction within the county. And every single property was still bid on by other people. And it just breaks your heart. Yeah. And and some of them, some of the properties were only $300. Oh 338 I was looking at the list today. $338 and like 20 cents, something like that. Jesus. But now... Now that it went to auction, it is now a thousand dollars or mm-hmm. you know two thousand mm-hmm. dollars or in some case five thousand dollars that people have to pay in order to hold on to their land. Yeah, and yeah. the thing that happens with the land that um, should be grandfathered in. If it's Mm -hmm. heirs property and someone has owned it for 150 years and it's identified as heirs and all of that, the county, if their land taxes were, say, $400 last year, right? Mm -hmm. But someone comes and builds what I call a McMansion, yeah, (laughs) like a Big (laughs) Mac mansion, you know, next door. Suddenly, their taxes go from go four hundred dollars yeah. to two or three thousand yeah. dollars in a year. Yeah, yeah. And you know, this happened earlier this year. A, a Gullah um, elder in her nineties, her husband just passed away. It's still in probate. They hadn't worked out the title or changed the title, and her taxes went from four hundred dollars to twenty five hundred. And she can't afford that. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, it's it's painful. Mm -hmm. It's very, very painful. Um, And so, you know, that's that's part of the the personal and and the the passion project. Yeah. You know, that low country gala is, you know, I don't have family that has land in jeopardy, Mm -hmm. but I feel like I have family that has land in jeopardy. Yeah. It's your community. So you're helping to raise funds for people. And then what what kind of work is being done to try and work around the legal aspects of like, say you you say the the California cousin who comes in and sells the land out from under people. What kind of legal work is being done to try to change it so that that can't happen anymore? Well, the Low Country Gullah Foundation, um, we raise funds. And in certain cases, like take the the elder that, you know, I was just tell, talking about, you know, we helped her with her taxes because mm-hmm. she couldn't do it. She would have yeah. would have just gone to the sale. Yeah. So, you know, in a case like that, you know, we'll we'll help financially. But 
we're not just divvying out cash mm-hmm. and just saying, have a nice day and come back next year and we'll yeah. help you again. Yeah. You know, so we have an entire program where we go, we dig a little deeper to find out why there's an issue. In her case, it's creating a will, succession planning, mm-hmm. you know, with the, the grandchildren or the great grandchildren or whoever the property is going to go to mm-hmm. so that the, the problem is resolved. So okay. it's walking her through that. So we have access to attorneys that we refer to that will help iron that out, right? If it's an heirs property issue, which is more cases than not, it's not very easy for someone to just call an attorney and say, can you help me fix this? It takes a genealogist to figure out all that thousand tree, Mm -hmm. leaf tree Mm -hmm. of heirs and then come to some kind of consensus. Uh, you know, I mean, once the research is done, then through the help of an attorney, come to a consensus on um, should we make the property an LLC or a trust or, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. what is the plan? Yeah. Um, if it's the land is vacant, how can the land pay for itself? Like mm-hmm. economic development ideas so that the the land is paying its own taxes um you know whatever case that may be to resolve their situation Mm -hmm. and then the other one is you know let's take someone who was living their life and then someone built that mcmansion next door they their taxes went up and so maybe it's it's really a question of how can we financially give you some guidance so that you're moving forward and not getting into the same jam financially every year, you know? So it's a targeted individualized um, process Mm -hmm. because everyone's is different. They could be an heir. They might not have, a. it might be heirs property. There may not be a will and there might not be financial. So then sometimes it's all three, but sometimes it's just one. So depending on the situation, that's, how we fix whatever mm-hmm. is necessary because we have to ch- we have to break the cycle otherwise you know we're just on a treadmill and you know we're going around and around and around yeah. and nothing is being resolved yeah i've listened to other interviews read articles about people who have lost their land due to uh issues with heirs property and but listening to you talk, it sounds like there are solutions like there there is work that's being done that is actually finding solutions for people, even though it is incredibly complicated and probably sometimes it's sort of a race against the clock kind of situation. But it listening to you talk does make me feel a little bit hopeful and that, you know, that's why the raising awareness is so important. So more people know about the work that you're doing. Yeah. And and that's part of the thing, because if I'm talking about the culture and the stories and the traditions, all of that it also includes the value of the land. And so part of the education with the culture is you know, it's it's an active culture, it's a vibrant culture, but it's a culture that also has some specific issues mm-hmm. that need to be resolved. Yeah. And so that's all part of the education that, you know, I'm, I'm trying to do. Mm-hmm. Um, because it can't just be, you know, hey, this is a bottle tree and isn't that great? Yeah. You know, yeah, it's great, but guess what? It goes on Gullah land most of the time. Mm-hmm. And, you know, If the land is gone, then, you know, there goes the bottle tree. Yeah. So, you know, it's it's all it's all encompassing of of all of the issues and um, and um, needs that the culture has. Yeah. This leads me. I want to kind of tie things up a little bit. But, you know, reading I was reading another article of yours this morning on your website, and I really encourage people to me, your your website and the work that you're doing is 
is so much more than just about the Gullah Geechee people. It, you know, I, I think some people might hear this and think, well, you know, that doesn't have anything to do with me. I personally have no connection to Gullah Geechee culture people, but I find it fascinating. And I was reading one of your articles or a couple of your articles this morning from the, um, what is it? Changing, changing perspectives. Yes. And you were talking about, um, you know, visiting Savannah Mm -hmm. and which is a city that I absolutely love, but you were talking about seeing it from with kind of with new eyes, you know, you, yes. you go to this place and then you realize all the stones that went into building the area along the river, which is just this incredibly beautiful area mm -hmm. that, I mean, you can feel the spirit of the place in Savannah. It's my favorite city in this country that I've ever been to. And mine too, yeah. you know, it, it, it was, well, go ahead, finish your question. <laughs> well, I mean, it, it just made me think, you know, it's sort of like, even though I don't have a personal connection to, well, I mean, actually I do, I'm descended from slaves on my mother's side, but, but mm -hmm. South American. And so the story is maybe a little, the stories are maybe a little more interesting to me than someone who has no connection at all. But listening to you talk about how the stones for that area were actually taken from the slave ships that were used yeah. as ballast, I didn't know that. And it's so fascinating, and it and it does the way you talk about how it makes you see the city in this whole new way. I think that's so important, and I I think that's why history is so important in general. So people may think, oh well, I have no connection to that. Yes, you do. You live in the place. Yeah. You, yeah. you know, it's it's important to know these things, and it and it and it adds a richness and a, a depth to your surroundings that you would never understand or feel otherwise unless you know that. And so I really encourage people to go to your website and, and read everything that's on there because it's just, <laughs> it's just a wealth of information. And especially, especially people who live in the area who, who don't know all of that about it, you know? Well, you know, it, but here's the thing. It's not just Savannah. It's also Charleston. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's also Boston. It's also totally. Philadelphia. Yeah. It's all it's all of the older cities. It's St. Augustine. Mm -hmm. You know, it's all yeah. of these cities that were essentially the first cities, the first colonies. Yeah. You know, that yeah. in American history. And so, you know, when you study American history, you also have to realize that all of it is American history and Gullah Geechee history is American history. Yes. And yeah. so when you think about it in those terms and you go to these cities and, you know, the, the cobblestones on, on the road, you know, I used to, as a child, you know, I always listened, could felt like I could listen to the horse hooves on the cobblestones. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, you know, yeah. that just was what I loved about going to Boston and Savannah and Charleston and mm -hmm. everything. Yeah. But, you know, it's it's until you dig a little deeper and you see things as they really are, you know, like take Charleston. If you walk down the street at the sidewalk line where the building starts, you can see these rectangular um, holes in the, the foundation of the building. They look decorative. Most people walk right by them. But when you know that those were the air holes for the enslaved people who were in the basement, yeah. that makes it different, you know? Or like you said, the ballast stones that held the, the, mm -hmm. the uh, ships upright that made all of the roadways along the, the riversides mm -hmm. in all of those cities along the water. To me, it's how history not only comes to life, but it's also when you know more about what you're seeing and experiencing, and then you can think about what it was like to be in that basement mm 
mm-hmm. looking out at the street at people's ankles as they walk by. Yeah. You know, or, you know, a lot of the bricks you were talking about, you know, the, the stones in Savannah, mm-hmm. you know, that the enslaved people would stick their fingers, their fingerprints into the bricks mm-hmm. just to show somebody in the future that they were there. Yeah. Or they would leave tribal markings in the bricks as they were baking them so that other people could recognize their tribe and know that someone else is here and they're mm-hmm. not alone. Mm-hmm. I mean, when you think about it that oh, way man, and you yeah. see things that way, it's powerful. It it's is just powerful. So powerful. Thank you so much for agreeing to talk to me today. This is just, I mean, (laughs) like we said before, we could just go on for hours and hours. But I really, I really hope that the people listening can take something away from this and check out the work that you're doing. Because I think this is, you know, like we're trying to say here, this is something that it's important for all of us and applies to all of us as, as yes. citizens of this place. And so I'll be posting links for your website. And is Thank there you. is there any way in particular that you think people could get involved or help? Um, if someone wanted to uh, make a donation, they can absolutely do that. There is a link on the uh, bottom of the website where you can make a donation. As far as being able to help, genealogy work, yeah. attorneys, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, there there's a ton of different what? ways that you can get involved and help mm-hmm. because it's it, it's important to be able to get the help wherever it can be and, you know, yeah. take it from there. Yeah. But the biggest need that we have right now is finances mm-hmm. because we need to be able to help wherever we need to. If yeah. it's paying the taxes or preventing someone from losing their land over $600 yeah. or some stupid amount like that. Yeah. I mean, that's the kind of thing that's, that's really important. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for talking with me. and also, Oh, absolutely. And, Happy to do it. Yeah, and thank you so much for the work that you're doing. It's really important. And, and Thank um, you. Best of luck to you, and um, keep it up. <laughs> thank I you. Wish you. I wish you all the luck and motivation uh, that, that's out there. And I hope, I appreciate I hope that. lots of people hear and tune in and help. I really do. I really do. And and, um, thank you for having me on with you today. Take care. Okay. You too. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thank you for joining us today. We'll be back next Monday. Tune in.